salam and good evening, my worthy of friends. Ah, salam and good evening to you, worthy of friend. This is what we call a Cinnabite, and I guess today it would be a seed oil-free Cinnabite episode. Basically, you get a bonus spillover episode, okay? And uh, you should be very excited. This was... Actually, the audio from the most popular breakout session from the Young Women's Leadership Summit this year. So we just had that June 9th through 11th in Dallas, Texas. It's our big women's conference that Turning Point USA puts on. And I had a little breakout session for people to listen to in person with three of the most popular spillover guests that we've ever had as far as health and wellness episodes go. Doula Karen Welton from Pain-Free Birth, Dr. Courtney Kayla, and Emily Dietrich, a.k.a. Little Ray of Health on Instagram. All of those guests have been so popular, and I thought, oh my gosh, to be able to get all of them in one place to talk all things home birth and breastfeeding and and living your best non-toxic life and getting off birth control and all of those different types of things with an audience live full of women, I just thought it would be chef's kiss. And uh, it really was. Actually, it was the most popular breakout panel of the entire event. The room was filled to capacity. And allegedly, there was like over 100 women in the hallway that wanted to get in that we had to say no just from fire code problems. Like it wouldn't be safe to have that many people packed into the room. So we had to turn them away. So here is your chance, whether you were turned away at the actual live event or you just couldn't be there, you now get to experience the entire conversation. So this is the audio from the anti-woke wellness panel with me, Alex Clark, Karen Welton, Dr. Courtney Kayla, and Emily Dietrich, Little Ray of Health from Young Women's Leadership Summit this week. Um, and, and that's really it. So I hope you enjoy this. And if you want to, you can watch this on the Politics YouTube channel. So make sure you're subscribed to that. Of course, I have to tell you, leave a five-star review, subscribe to this channel. It helps support us and enjoy this bonus little Cinnabite, seed oil-free Cinnabite episode. Who knew that we would be doing all of this birth control coverage at a conservative event? I'm drifting. (laughs) I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm totally spinning. Man, a couple years ago, I mean, I was just, Nurse Kate was was laughing with me. I said, she said, I'm so proud of you for covering these subjects. I said, you know, when I got hired in uh, 2019 at Turning Point, I was the last person, I was the chicken nugget princess. I was the last person that would ever be covering home births and getting off birth control and all this. So we've really come a long way. So, hey, there's hope if any chicken nugget princesses are in here tonight. All right? You, can, you may be converted. We will try our best to turn you into a non-toxic extremist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm Alex Clark, host of The Spillover, and these are three of my most popular spillover guests of all time. Oh my God, it's so cool. And I'm gonna just let you guys introduce yourself. So if you want to um, say your name and your credentials, what you're known for and what you do. Sure, yeah, I'm Dr. Courtney Kayla. I am a chiropractor and I specialize in pediatric and prenatal chiropractic. But more specifically, I think a common misconception with chiropractic is that we are doctors of the musculoskeletal system. We are actually doctors of the nervous system. So I specialize in nervous system function as it relates with moms and babies and really everyone. And is known as the non-toxic lifestyle queen on Instagram. (laughs) My name is Karen Welton, otherwise known as Pain Free Birth on Instagram, and I'm a doula, a childbirth educator, and I teach women how to have pain free births. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm Little Ray of Health on Instagram. <laughs> I love all of you. Um, I am a board certified health coach and I work specifically with women's hormones. So I help women use food as medicine to balance their hormones, ditch birth control, and just really take their health and fertility back. Now, who on this panel has kids? Okay, so you two, and I have my questions written here. Um, Dr. Courtney, did you opt for a hospital birth for your first and would you do something different in the future? I absolutely did not opt for a hospital birth for my first, and I loved birthing at home. I like to explain 
where you birth, kind of like a stomach virus. Now, birth is not a sickness, but until you've given birth, the most vulnerable you've ever felt and most primal is when you're vomiting or it's coming out of both ends. So it's like, think of if I'm in a hotel room and I'm like, oh, it's coming out of both ends. I feel terrible. My thoughts are, I just want to be home. I want to be on my bathroom floor. I just want to be in my bed. So with birth, I knew that I was going to instinctively behave the same way of, I just want to be home. And I labored a lot in my bathroom. For Dr. Courtney and Karen, what are the unnecessary or toxic things to look for when it comes to a hospital birth? Because I always think of, uh, what is that stuff? The little eye goop cream they put on babies. I, there's, that's very contentious. Some people say you really need to do that. Some people don't. So what are the do's and don'ts if you are going to have birth in a hospital? She's looking at me. Where do I start? Um, <laughs> for, for a straightforward, normal physiological birth, all of it. And that's just the truth. Your body's designed to give birth. It's a physiological process, just like digestion or blinking or your heart beating. And you are designed to give birth without medical intervention. And there's a famous quote that I love that says, birth is designed to work even if nobody else is there. And so your body is incredibly wise. It knows exactly what to do. But I would say the ones, if you, if you do plan on giving birth in a hospital, the things to look out for all throughout there are things to like make sure you need to know how to advocate for yourself and speak up for yourself and follow your intuition, having support there. Um, the third stage of labor is actually the stage of labor with the most interventions stat statistically. So you might be surprised. That's the stage that happens after the baby's born. So a lot of us get nervous about what kind of interventions they'll do during labor and they'll want to do Pitocin or they'll push this or that. And all of that's true too. But the most actually happens immediately after that baby comes out. And the eye goop is one. They would like to often cut the cord early or after only 30, 60 seconds, 30 and, and seconds. How long should we be leaving the umbilical cord on the baby ideally for health reasons? I say, and a lot of professionals will say, wait until white. So that may be two minutes, that may be 10 minutes. You can feel the cord yourself. And if there's any pulsing and if there's any blood flowing, you can feel it and they'll still be, it'll look red or purple. What are it, the benefits of that, of not cutting the cord so soon? The, the, if allowing the placenta to fully drain into your baby gives the baby 30% of its blood supply. By clamping early, you're, you're cutting off 30% of your baby's blood, which is the baby's blood. So you wanna let it fully drain and it gives lots of stem cells and it gives your baby a better start to life. So there's literally no reason to cut it early, just let it fully drain. The f oh, go ahead. Also, that just led down a path of like, we're cutting cords early and then we're administering vitamin K, which is not just a vitamin. It has a black box warning, which means it can cause death for clotting factors. Whereas if we would just let the baby get 30% of its blood, it would get a lot of its own clotting factors. It wasn't until following pain-free birth on Instagram that I learned that women giving birth in that traditional style, laying on the bed with our legs up in the air or whatever, that's actually totally wrong. That is not how our bodies were designed to give birth. Yeah. So what is the correct position that we're supposed to be giving birth in, and why do hospitals ask us to do that then? So I say that the correct position is the one that feels intuitively right to your body, but there are some more significant risks and it prolongs labor if you're on your back in what we call supine position for many reasons. It restricts the movement of the tailbone, which is designed to expand in childbirth and open, your whole body is opening. And so sitting on your butt, you're sitting on your tailbone so it can't open fully. You're also sitting on baby's head. And if you look at the shape of the birth canal, you have to push the baby down and up like this. So you're pushing against gravity in the supine position on your back. It's just gonna make it a lot more harder and difficult and more likely for that baby to get what we call stuck. So if you look at traditional cultures, most women birth in upright positions or on hands and knees. And so I always recommend starting that and changing positions frequently in labor, especially in the second stage, and really trusting your intuition. You know, I would get flashes of inspiration and pictures of like the next position to get in when I was in labor. And I think it's, you know, I could tell you this is the correct position, but for someone sitting in this audience, they may say, well, uh, me laying on my side was the 
best position for me. So I'm not here to dictate to you what position to give birth in. And that's the point. <laughs> having a doula, having a home birth or, or giving birth even at a birthing center, you have that freedom, unlike a hospital where they're going to say, you can only push this way, you can't yeah. eat this, you have all these strict rules. And that's why it's so interesting to me as conservatives when we're so freedom-minded, um, being able to, with one of the most precious moments of our life, make our own decisions. And that's why I found this subject so interesting lately is I'm like, why are we letting them tell us all of these things to do or don't do yeah. when you have birth at home or in a birthing center, you can yeah. do your own thing. And it's only because it's convenient to answer your other right. question. It's convenient for the doctor. They can see, but it's just, they can see just as much if you flip on your hands and knees in the hospital bed and push your baby out that way. Many of my clients do that, like leaning over the head of the bed or on hands and knees. It's just so unusual and outside their box that it kind of scares medical professionals. They're not used to seeing unmedicated women with full mobility giving birth. But you can introduce them to that. <laughs> okay, so Emily, little ray of health, tell us about the foods that we need to be eating to replenish nutrients after they've been depleted, after taking birth control for many years, and then what we should be eating to prepare for pregnancy one day. Yes. Okay. So being on birth control, birth control is going to deplete you of essential vitamins, minerals, nutrients, vitamins A, D, E, K, all your minerals, potassium, magnesium. It can cause leaky gut. And so then this creates a cascade of effect. And leaky gut, your gut is supposed to be tight, kind of like a mesh strainer, a really tight mesh strainer. But when you have leaky gut from glyphosate, Roundup, just a bunch of environmental factors, it basically turns your gut into like a cyclone fence. So these things that are supposed to stay in your digestive system can get out into your bloodstream and it just causes so many issues. So I would say that getting off of birth control, you're gonna wanna support your gut as much as possible. Taking a really good probiotic or a colostrum supplement, taking like magnesium is gonna be a huge one. Magnesium is an essential like mineral that you need. It is involved in every process in your body. And the issue with food these days is our soils are so depleted that we cannot get enough magnesium in our food. So my mantra is using food as medicine, but there are certain things that we do have to supplement with just because of the state of our food now. And so I would say magnesium is a huge one, but just focusing on eating as many nutrient-dense foods as possible. So like one ingredient foods, foods that don't need a nutrition label, shopping in the perimeters of the supermarket, just eating healthy fats like avocado, olive oil, real grass-fed butter, grass-fed meats, eggs, free-range organic eggs, chicken, just not being as scared of saturated fats because they are so, so good for you, especially cholesterol. Cholesterol is another one that really gets a bad rap. And cholesterol is involved in so many things. You need cholesterol to synthesize vitamin D. You need all of these things that work synergistically. We were created perfectly and we have everything that we need. And when we reach outside of ourselves and outside of our world to man-made unnatural things, like that's where things start to go awry. So I would say focusing on like, like I said, just the most simple foods, right? Like meat and potatoes and veggies, organic, local, if you can find it, and just getting back to the roots of how we're supposed to live. Why, Emily and Courtney, do you think that girls as young as nine now are starting periods? We'll start. Or yeah, whoever. <laughs> I would say probably the biggest thing that I would say is like the phytoestrogens in all of the things. So plastic that's around us, fragrances, candles, lotions, body sprays, like air fresheners, detergents, all of these things are endocrine disruptors that can act and they can basically act as estrogen and bind to the same estrogen receptors. And that's what's causing, I think, a big major role in why yeah, girls as young as nine going into puberty. I don't have an, I, she hit the nail on the <laughs> head. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, Courtney and Karen, how seriously should we take the rules on what we should and shouldn't eat during pregnancy? They're like, no lunch meat, no sushi, you know, uh, is that serious or is that like an old, that's old news now? You know, it's so funny. There's a book by Lily Nichols, who's a registered dietitian called Real Food for Pregnancy. Can I tell you a secret? Everyone in this room? It's okay. Lily Nichols is going to be on the spillover this month, oh, or yay. we're recording this month. It's coming out. My producer's like, wait, I don't know when it's coming out, but we're recording. So anyway, she's going to be a spillover guest. Well, this book, I highly recommend it because it's fascinating that the research of what you can and can't eat during pregnancy does not line up with the recommendations from our government. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this overarching theme of like insurance-based medicine or government-based medicine is not evidence-based medicine. So her book is filled with research. I mean, one chapter probably referenced like a hundred different studies and it blows your mind. Like you can't eat deli meat. You can't eat 
egg yolks, yeah. <laughs> raw egg yolks. Yeah. So write down in your notes on your phone, Lily Nichols, look up her book, read it. So you're in, and by the way, you should be taking notes during this. Um, <laughs> and then read that as homework. So you, when the spillover episode comes out, you're like, oh my gosh, yes. You know. And, and I think it's important to also understand there's context for everything. And it's all, it's always like, ask yourself in compared to what? So I think a lot of those recommendations are bogus. I remember like reheating all my deli meat in the microwave to kill the bacteria in my first pregnancy and by my third I'm eating sushi. So <laughs> like do what you feel intuitively is best for you. Also know the evidence and read the books. And like, for example, you're way more likely to get E. coli from lettuce and spinach than from deli meat. So the evidence doesn't line up with the recommendations and we're freaking out over eating a sandwich when we're more likely to get sick from the salad. <laughs> Let's start with you, Emily. Uh, I want to ask each of you, in your lines of work, what is the biggest lies being told to women? Birth control is safe and effective. It is not. It's not safe. I know, Alex, you, you touched on so many good points in your like opening speech, but it is a class, it's a group one carcinogen. It there are so many parents out there fighting to get a black box warning because there's so many young women that have died from brain aneurysms and blood clots that have gone to their brain from birth control. And this has been proven. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're not, these companies, it doesn't matter because they're getting such big payouts. And so I would just say that we are fed this lie that birth control is our only option, that if we're not on birth control, we're gonna get pregnant, that like periods are painful and cramps are just a part of womanhood and it all sucks and that's just how it's gonna be. And it's so not true. And I could tell you from over 1,500 women that I've helped that, that are like, I used to be miserable, doubled over, like heating pads on my back and my stomach, and now I'm fine, and I never thought, and I, the same thing for myself, I never thought that there would be a day where like, my period wouldn't affect me. Like I could go about my daily life, and it wasn't an issue, and I, would, I think that that's just the biggest lie that we're told around birth control and periods. Biggest lie for you, Karen, and you can add your own, but I also want to ask you, what about the lie that uh, women think, I'm too small to give birth? Oh my gosh, there's so many I could answer this with. But like to tag off your answer, I want you guys to just think about the progression of these belief systems for just a minute with me because we're told from the time we're young girls, you have to have a period and it sucks. Who, who's believed that in, in their life at some point? Oh, having a period sucks. Being a woman sucks where my, my body's cursed, we're the weaker, you know, gender. Like, we're told these things, whether it's from the culture, the movies, the politics, childbirth is supposed to be scary and painful and traumatizing. Who's believed that? Like, at some point in your life, right? Like, we are told, we are shown on the movie screens, the, you know, and produced by, that are produced by, like, white men in Hollywood. This is what childbirth is. Screaming in pain, traumatizing, almost dying. <laughs> it's scary. Your body's broken, right? Your hips are too small for birth. If you're a petite woman, who here has been, a, is petite and was nervous, maybe I can't give birth naturally because my hips are too small. These are all lies, We've been told that this is scary and painful and traumatizing and we just have to go through it and our bodies are broken and we need medical assistance. It's all BS. It all comes from culture. It all comes from this narrative that's being shoved down our throats and it's not true. Your body is brilliantly designed for birth by an intelligent creator. It knows intuitively what to do. Your uterus knows how to push. Your body knows how to expand. Your spirit knows how to receive information and communicate with your body. And, but what happens is the, all of these industries that are wanting the pharmaceuticals that want to put you on birth control, the narratives of like your body being broken and childbirth is scary, we actually disconnect from our bodies. It creates the, and here you need pain medicine, so now we're going to numb ourselves and completely disconnect from our body in childbirth. Like all of this is creating disconnection with our own body. And our body is so wise. It knows what to do. And so I could go on, but those are the lies that, that it is my passion to dismantle and show women how brilliantly your body is created for birth. Even if you don't know how to birth up in your head, your body knows. And you can trust that it's wise and intuitive and brilliantly designed, and it's not broken. The biggest lie is that your body is not capable of restoring and repairing its own function. So some, I'm gonna share just a few testimonies that I've, 
I see miracles every single day and it would not be without Jesus Christ. I will always praise the creator over the creation. But like, <laughs> I mean, we've had a newborn baby come in with four severed nerves right here that they're gonna have to surgically repair but wanna wait until they're like three months old. And they go back in for that surgery and that child did nothing but chiropractic care and three of those nerves fully reattached themselves and they only had to repair one. Your body is capable of restoring and repairing its own function. We just sometimes have to get all these toxins and physical, chemical, and emotional stressors out of the way so that your body can have streamlines of communication between your brain and your body so that it can function the way that God created it to. Another story I have is a four-year-old who was taking Miralax for two years straight, which if you read the package insert, insert, you should only take it for seven days, but their doctor said, no, just take it multiple times a day, every day for two years. She was addicted to it. After seven adjustments, she was off Miralax and having regular bowel movements all by herself. Wow. Okay. What are some ways that we can self-evaluate our lives and our diets on a daily basis to know if our typical patterns are working for or against our overall wellness? Emily, you want to go first? Um, obviously, your period is like your health report card. So your period acts as the canary in the coal mine. And if you're not getting a period or it's irregular or it's extremely painful, these are signs from your body that something is going on. And again, birth control suppresses this. We're shutting down. Another thing birth control does is it shuts down the basically conversation that happens between your brain and your ovaries. So you sever that tie as well. And I just think that like your period, how often it happens, how long your period is, even the color of your period blood, all of these things are indicators. And if we're not getting a period or it's painful, we need to check in with ourselves and say, okay, what, what's going on in my life? What are my stressors? What am I, am I scrolling TikTok and Instagram, doom scrolling before bed? That's a major thing. And it's so common and it's so normalized. And I'm telling you, it's jacking up your cortisol and affecting you 100%. Even these things that we don't think about, like regardless of food, food is one of the biggest things, but there's so many other things. And so I would say your period is definitely one of the biggest vital signs that you can look at. And you get it once a month. It's a monthly report card. You can check in with your body. Daily ways to evaluate is my, are my wellness and health habits working for me or against me? So I love looking at menstrual function but I also wanna look at sleep, digestion, and skin. I think those are four of the major functions that your body is constantly expressing. And menstrual cycles are great to assess, but again, it's only once a month. So if we can check in on other things that are happening on a daily basis, or even just looking at one week in time, how are you sleeping every single night? What is the quality of your sleep? What does your skin look like? Your skin is a window of what's happening on the inside. And then um, how's your digestion? Are you having a bowel movement first thing in the morning when you wake up or is it taking you some time? Are you having to drink coffee first? You should wake up and like literally go right to the bathroom and have a great bowel movement to start your day. So I love to look at just the natural ways your body communicates with you and assess all of that so you can see how your body is functioning and see key areas where you might need some support. How hormonal should we be on our periods? Good one. This is a good one. Well, fun fact, you're actually the least technically hormonal. All your hormones are at their lowest on your period. So you're technically the least hormonal, which is pretty interesting. Um, but you're going to feel, so since everything is at its lowest and estrogen and testosterone, all of these things play a role in our energy, our motivation, our creativity. So all of that's going to be at a lull on your period. So this is not a time to make plans and go out and hit it hard at the gym. You're supposed to be introspective and just kind of chill out a little bit. Listen to your body. It is normal that you feel a little bit sluggish or unmotivated on your period, but you shouldn't be like super depressed or anxious or lashing out at those that you love and calling it, oh, it's just my mood swings. I'm just on my period. That's not normal. Karen, just to, because I was, I'm thinking about this with, with hormones fluctuating and everything, how about postpartum depression? What are, what's your advice for how to best avoid that after you have a child or how to deal with it? So postpartum depression is multifaceted. It, it can be nutritional, it can be hormonal, it can be mental, it can be spiritual, it can be emotional. I always look at the connection first between mom and baby. Also understanding there could be very natural physical roots of why a mother may be experiencing postpartum depression, but in my opinion, a vast majority of the women who are experiencing postpartum depression is because they had a traumatic birth. 
and they were disconnected from their baby. So they didn't get the, the peak hormonal release that they needed, which is physiological in a normal birth, because it was either suppressed by drugs or it was um, interfered with because of medical intervention or trauma. And so because their oxytocin never peaked, it never reached the ceiling, the threshold it needed to at birth, your, your body is designed to release a huge surplus of oxytocin, not just at birth in labor, and then it continues to release every time you breastfeed and connect to your baby. Every time you look your baby in the eyes, every time you do skin to skin. Again, we're going back to the connection. It's oxytocin is the love hormone. So if a mother is experiencing postpartum depression, I like to look at how are you connecting to your baby? Because you can actually hack the postpartum by altering your hormones by doing things that release more oxytocin. And that's one of the things I did when I started feeling depressed in the postpartum was how can I get more oxytocin? And then I realized it's the bond I have with my baby, right? We're talking about it all this week. It's the attachment we have to our kids. It's the connection we have to our babies and to our bodies. Are you numbing it and disconnecting or are you fully present? And a lot of, I believe, postpartum depression or baby blues can be cleared up by addressing the connection and the bond with the baby as well as looking at nutritional deficiencies and hormone levels. This question can be for any of you. Um, what is the best way to get your hormones on track after birth? I mean, okay, then I, I kind of answered that already, so. Yeah, okay. I feel like she answered it with emotional, but I mean nutrition, again, eating all these foods that God put on this earth, right? Like liver is going to, no one wants that answer, but beef liver is like the most nutrient-dense thing that you could eat ever basically. And so I would say, get it in a capsule or cut, freeze, cut it up into tiny chunks, freeze it and just throw it back like an actual supplement. Like that works too, but that's going to be one of the most nutrient dense things. Oysters, super high in zinc. Zinc is really important. Dark chocolate has magne like, there's so many real foods that if we stop searching online for the best supplement to balance our hormones, we have everything that we need. Like again, God gave us all of these things. We don't need to look outside of this world. It's again about the creator versus creation. Dr. Courtney, what everyday household items are we using that seem innocent but are really completely destroying our health and hormones? Okay, so like I personally think the number one biggest issue in your home is fragrance. So fragrance is just this overarching slap a label on thousands of chemicals that have never been tested and don't have to be disclosed to you. And so if you could make a big impact on something within your home to just get rid of things that have a smell to them, get rid of your laundry detergent. If it's scented candles, plugins, candles. Okay. Yeah. But there's, there's great natural like ways to have good smell. Like essential oils being diffused are very lovely. Beeswax candles smell a little bit like honey. They also emit negative ions, which the highest source of negative ions is when you're standing in front of a waterfall or standing at the beach. It's like the movement of the waves, it's negative ions if we're talking, you know, like at an atomic level. Positive ions are emitted from your television or your cell phone. So beeswax candles actually emit negative ions, which give you that feeling like you're on the beach. Ooh, I love that. See, I told you, write this down. <laughs> if we are having trouble falling asleep, what could help? Okay, yeah. Um, sleep function. So really, it should take you about 15 minutes to fall asleep. If you are like closing your eyes as you hit your pillow, you are sleep deprived. That means you're not getting enough sleep. So I want to see about 15 minutes. Also, your melatonin, which is a hormone that helps you sleep, peaks in the middle of the night. If your melatonin is peaking later, then that means you're having too much screen time in the morning, and, or sorry, before you go to bed. The blue light is delaying melatonin pr production. The moms are whispering to their kids in the audience, see, I told you. <laughs> so we really want to protect your body's ability to produce melatonin. I know a lot of people say that you can take melatonin. There's information, you know, for every topic, pro and con for everything. Uh, I personally believe that melatonin is a hormone as long, I believe vitamin D is as well. And so I don't recommend taking it. You can sparingly, but I don't recommend relying on it to get good sleep. If you're giving your body a hormone, 
your body has a cell with a receptor that looks like this, and that hormone goes boop, 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 and fills right into that hole. So then your body says, well, it's already filled. I don't need to produce it myself. It's exactly what birth control does. So I personally don't recommend taking melatonin before bed. Again, controversial. There's a lot of different thoughts on it. Um, I also, you should be like waking up pretty much before your alarm and feeling very well rested. You shouldn't be like groggy in the morning. That means you're not getting your natural cortisol spike. You should get a cortisol spike that just wakes you up in the morning and you should use that natural cortisol instead of going to your coffee cup and giving yourself some like coffee cortisol. Oh, Emily has hot takes on coffee first thing in the morning. Go ahead, Emily. Oh. Yeah, if you're doing it, please stop. Please, <laughs> for the love of all things holy, don't have coffee. It's gonna spike your cortisol. It's also an appetite suppressant. So. Really, and this is probably the hardest habit, even for me, was to kick drinking coffee first thing in the morning. It's part of like my morning ritual. It's such a thing, but you want to eat breakfast. Do not, even if it's, you don't have to have a full on, like all American, three eggs, like everything, at least something in your system before you're drinking coffee. Otherwise, it's going to spike your cortisol. It's just going to set off a blood sugar roller coaster for the whole entire day. So start with breakfast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do not drink coffee before you eat breakfast. Don't have coffee ever on an empty stomach. I mean, no matter what time of day. But you want to eat something, even if it's a small stack, snack, some protein, some fat, a little bit of carbs in there so that you can help stave off that cortisol spike and balance your blood sugar. And then also getting morning sunlight. So like Courtney was talking about, you should wake up feeling good. And then first thing before you look at a screen, go get natural light. If you wake up before the sun rises, flick all the lights in your house on. That helps. I mean, natural sunlight, sun, I don't want to say sunlight because some people live where it's cloudy, full spectrum light. If it's cloudy, that's okay. Obviously, actual sunlight is great, but full spectrum light is going to help start this like 12-hour alarm essentially where when you get sun in the morning or light, 12 hours later, your melatonin starts to drip out. And I say 10 minutes in full sun and yeah. 20 minutes if it's cloudy. Question, when is the best time to work out for our bodies? Like, is it, is it better to work out in the morning, midday, night? I mean, it's definitely not first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. I wouldn't recommend that because usually you're going to drink coffee first. So if you can wait a little bit. To go with your natural cortisol cycles, kind of like what she's saying, mid-morning or mid-afternoon. Working out at like at the end of the day, again, is going to spike your cortisol. Your nervous system is going to go haywire, and it's going to take a while for you to calm back down. So ideally, mid-morning or mid-afternoon. Karen, I know um, certain friends of mine who are moms already, They some of them have really struggled with breastfeeding and opted for formula, but almost everything you see on the shelves at stores is just riddled with crap. I mean, it is absolutely awful. So what is the next best suggestion if breast milk isn't available for your baby when it comes to breastfeeding? And actually, if you want to just talk about breastfeeding in general, tips, tricks, what women should know, what to do if they're yeah. having trouble. I mean, that, that that's a whole conversation in itself, but um, assuring, having a physiological birth is one of the best ways to assure healthy breastfeeding. It's that bond and connection that I'll, I'll just keep coming back to. And, and what is a physiological birth? So yeah, good question. A physiological birth is a natural unmedicated birth and it's a birth the way that your body's designed to birth. And so breastfeeding is another physiological thing your body does all by itself. And breastfeeding has obviously so many benefits for those who may struggle with it. I, I'm not a lactation consultant, so I definitely recommend going to see a professional international board certified lactation consultant to really assess the problems. We're seeing a lot of tongue ties now. I'm sure you could speak to that a ton. There's a lot of things happening. Um, knowing that it's not your fault, that sometimes it takes baby a long time to like get that latch down and learn, and you're learning for the first time, and it can be really stressful. The very beginning is the hardest. Take a breastfeeding course, work with board certified lactation consultant early on, it will save you so much stress and heartache. And if it's absolutely after working with a lactation consultant for not just like one appointment, but keep going and keep working on it. If, it, if there's really something uniquely wrong, and it's a very small percentage of women that truly cannot breastfeed, I just wanna say that. Like we overdiagnose, um, what is the term I'm blanking on it now, the low, um, low milk supply, there's a, there's a technical, technical term, um, it's overdiagnosed. 
And most, in mo most cases, it's not that you have or insufficient glandular supply, that's the word. Um, your body can breastfeed. Even women with small breasts have enough, can produce enough milk. Um, it's really a nutritional deficiency from women who grow up typically in like third world countries or who never fully developed in their breasts that cannot breastfeed or had previous surgery. Those are typically what you see more so having insufficient glandular supply. And so um, if you fit into that very small category of women, I would recommend looking into donated breast milk. Always stay within this, your species, right? Because form, formula is cow's milk and it's got tons of chemicals in it. Now, obviously we want to feed the baby. We, we don't want to like not feed the baby. That, that's a no-no. So, so when you're trying to feed the baby and the only option is, is like this super toxic formula crap with all these terrible ingredients, like what, do you, what is the next best thing to breast milk? L look up um, milk sharing groups. Like there are lots of mothers that have an oversupply or have lost a baby and are still pumping and breastfeeding because their body is still making breast milk. Make relationships with these women. There's lots of Facebook groups. There's, um, there's organizations that actually collect human breast milk and share it with mothers who need it or who have NICU babies who are vulnerable. There are some hospitals that store donated breast milk and you can request it. If your baby goes to the NICU, you don't have to give them formula. And they typically overfeed babies with formula in the hospitals. Breast milk from human mothers is always ideal. And I would, I would find someone that can, that, that can donate to your baby. Let's talk about weight, healthy ways to lose it, mistakes we're making, uh, I don't know, best way to help your hormones with, uh, support them for fat loss and all that good stuff. Emily and or Courtney. You go first. I feel I'll like follow. you're the hormone queen. <laughs> I mean, it's a way because you had some interesting takes on uh, 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 having a little bit of a pooch is healthy for women. Yeah. Okay, yes, oh, yes. Good. Let's talk <laughs> about. You're like, oh, tell me Woo! more. <laughs> Let's Everyone talk about like... normal human physiology, okay? <laughs> so, like, men, their reproductive organs are on the outside of their body, and we're, like, praising them for how big they are, right? <laughs> but women, our reproductive organs are on the inside of our body, right here. And yet, we suck them in so that we can have a flat stomach? No. No. You're not created to have a flat stomach. You're created to have a little bit of a curvature here. And so it is okay to embrace that your body looks different. In fact, prepubescent females, their uterus is more of like a tubular shape. And then as you go through puberty, it turns into more of a pear shape. And so we're trying to make ourselves look prepubescent. And I just want to give you all permission to breathe with your belly, let your belly hang, and just own your reproductive organs, sucking them in for the name of being skinny is not worth it. And, I was, yeah. and everyone said amen. Yeah, yeah, say it louder. Yeah, that's really important. And I think there's so many different aspects of weight loss and like that's one of them, nervous system and this like tensing up your body all the time and women wanting to look like they did when they were 17 or 18 and it's just not gonna happen. You weren't like a full grown woman at that point. But I would say some nutrition, eating breakfast, so not skipping breakfast, not intermittent fasting. I just did a whole podcast on this. If anyone wants to look it up in depth, no fasting. We look at these things, these studies that are done on men, right? Hit cardio, intermittent fasting, low carb diets. Women were excluded from most of those studies. So they're done on men and postmenopausal women. So these are not women with a menstrual cycle because it's too many variables essentially to study. It makes it very confusing. Um, but you really need to just focus on eating protein, high protein diet. I mean, ideally at least a hundred grams, one gram for every pound of body weight is really where you want to be. And it's protein's the most satisfying macronutrient. So it's going to keep you full. You're going to feel good. It's going to give you energy. It's going to help build muscle. So doing workouts that help you build muscle and really resting accordingly, not doing these HIIT workouts, not going to Orange Theory or Barry's workout or these boot camps day after day after day. Wait, you what does need, that mean? So we should only go to something like Orange Theory, what, once a week or certain like, times of the yeah, month or what? Maybe a couple times a week. Ovulation. So during ovulation, this is when your energy is the highest. This is the best time for those kinds of workouts. So like 
definitely not on your period or right before your period. This is when you're more prone to stress. So your threshold is a lot lower. So like anytime you, again, do a HIIT workout right before your period, your period is probably going to suck a lot more than it would have if you had just listened to your body, which probably told you that it wanted to rest. So these days of like no days off and HIIT cardio and fasting and low carb, it's the complete opposite of what the female body needs to like maintain a healthy weight. I just want to add that men and women, and this speaks to conservatives trying to really stress there is a difference in gender, and it's very important to not abandon that because even things like working out, men and women should be working out differently. We shouldn't be working out like men. Our bodies are completely different. They need different things. We have to do different types of workouts at different types of the month, ideally. So that's just very, very important. When we abandon biological gender, we're really putting our health at risk in those situations. What is the best way to completely reset our body's toxic overload in seven days? So these women that are here, if they want to go home and they say, okay, I want to start living this non-toxic life, best way to reset? I would evaluate what you are currently using the most frequently, and that's going to have the biggest impact on your health. So I can sit here in front of you and say, you should get non-toxic makeup. But like if you're only putting makeup on on the weekends, that's probably not going to have the biggest impact on your health or be the most bang for your buck. So just look at your current life. You're probably drinking water every day. I would prioritize investing in a water filtration system. It ranges from like five to $6,000 for a whole house system to like $40 for a little pitcher that you can just keep in your fridge and refill it constantly. So you can choose what works best for your budget, but if you evaluate where you're using most frequently and then just start there, you're going to have the best impact on your health. I love fragrance is a great one. The clothes you're wearing, if it's coated in fragrance, you're smelling it all day long. So maybe changing out your laundry detergent, just taking it one piece at a time. For me personally, I can't like know this information about toxins and keep them in my house and slowly change one product at a time. It works if that's what you need to do for your budget and that is cool. But for me, it's like very painful. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta clear all this stuff out and bring in new. But I want, what I want you to hear from that is that it's simple. Like remove, I'm a big fan of like not using soap on your body. I think that your microbiome is like the best thing ever, and so you shouldn't wash and strip it away. The conservatives are saying no soap. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't like to use soap on my body. I'll wash my hands with soap. We don't have to argue about that, but I don't like to use soap on my body. And the thing is, is like, for some of y'all are looking at me like, you're crazy. So there is a replacement. You can use a body wash. It costs $25. So then you're like, you're telling me I need to spend $25 on body wash? No, I'm telling you to just use water. But like, if you, if that freaks you out, you can spend $25 on body wash and still protect your microbiome. Okay. Karen, when people say things like, okay, I hear you on home birth, sounds nice, we get to sleep in our own bed that night and all of this, but what if something happens during birth? Uh, who's going to help me? Does a, doula, do, does a doula, a midwife, do these people even know how to deal with emergencies? It's a great question and probably the number one concern with home birth and my mentality is I don't use the medical system unless I need it. So if my kid breaks their arm, I'm going to take them to the emergency room. If my labor is stalled after days in labor and something is clearly wonky going on, I'm probably going to go to the hospital and get an ultrasound, maybe get an epidural, maybe get Pitocin, maybe get something. Like, don't, it can be really easy to hear from those of us in the natural birth community that these are the ideals, these are the good practices to live by and make it an ultimatum. And then what happens is, oh, well, my labor didn't go according to plan, or I had an emergency. And then we have to use medical you know, assistance, and we feel guilty. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. There are lots of women I work with who rightfully needed medical intervention and went to the hospital to get it. In a home birth, the midwife is the medical expert. Midwives are medically trained, and most people don't realize this. They think they're like hippies on a farm somewhere, and they wear a bonnet, and they catch your baby. No, they come with a hospital in their bag. <laughs> and so you can look at the studies, and there's lots of studies, one of them from The Lancet that had over, I think, 500,000 women that showed that home birth has no increased risk to your baby than a hospital birth. But it also had significantly decreased interventions such as cesarean, assisted deliveries, uh, epidurals, I, um, literally every intervention known to man was far less in, in a home birth. But home birth is not for everyone. And I don't tell everyone, go out and get a home birth. I say, where do you feel the most safe? 
if you feel the most safe, and I love what Courtney said about like, where would you feel most comfortable being sick or having the stomach bug? I actually will say, where do you feel comfortable having sex? Because birth is as intimate as sex. It's actually the culmination, the final stage of physical intimacy. And we don't look at birth as a sexual act, but it is the final result of sexual intimacy. That's the creation, right? And it's incredibly vulnerable. And so wherever you feel the most safe giving birth and becoming vulnerable and fully letting go and releasing is where you should give birth, but have proper support. I fully endorse like really good like experienced midwifery care because my midwife is there for the 2% chance that something does go wrong and I need her help. She helped resolve, you know, potential shoulder dystocia. She knew what position to get me and she knew how to intervene. She can resuscitate the baby. They bring fetal resuscitation kits. They bring Pitocin in case you hemorrhage and bleed too much. Most people don't know that. Almost everything that happens that would be an emergency in the hospital they can usually treat at home. And if they can't, they will transfer you. And usually they see those warning signs before it becomes an emergent life or death situation. A good midwife knows what signs to look out for and they will recommend transporting to the hospital. And so about 15% of home births end up transferring. A home birth transfer is not a failure. It's a good use of resources. Mm. And you see this in other countries. In England, they have a huge network and system where the midwives work very closely with the hospitals and the OBs. And if you need to transfer, you do. And there's way more women giving birth with midwives than here in the US. It's like less than 10%. Yeah. So it's really lopsided. There's a lot of influence from the pharmaceutical companies and the medical companies that push all women toward OBs. And OBs are surgeons. They are trained to intervene. If you don't want a surgical birth or birth with lots of interventions and hands all over you, go find a midwife. It's standard of care in most other countries except the US. And it doesn't need to be fringe. It's seen as fringe here, but it doesn't have to be. It's a good use of resources. And be smart. Don't, don't like be cling so tight to your unmedicated birth that you do put your baby in danger when you need medical intervention. Like I feel like that needs to be said sometimes because we can get so extreme in our views. And I fully support when women feel like they need intervention to get it and follow your intuition. OK, question. We have time for one more question or two? One. Do you want to hear about uh, what types of birth control is better than others if you have to do it, or do you want to hear about uh, childhood vaccine schedules? Vaccine. All right, Dr. Courtney. Yeah. Okay, so listen, I think Alex did such a good job breaking down the history of birth control yesterday, and so I'm going to break down just a tiny bit. I have like, you know, one minute, a tiny bit of the history of vaccines in our country. So in 1986, there was the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, and it basically said that Health and Human Services was supposed to test every two years the vaccines and just make sure that they're safe. 30 years later, the Informed Consent Action Network filed a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, to get that documentation saying, hey, I wanna see your safety studies. They didn't do it. For 30 years, they didn't test the safety of these vaccines. So. For me and my family, I don't want to be the guinea pig for this stuff. And I just want you guys to feel informed in every decision that you make and know that there are risks either way. There are risks to taking a vaccine. There are risks to not taking a vaccine and making an informed decision so that you have peace, that you can accept whatever risk happens. Absolutely incredible. Are they not? Right now, if you're not already, which I would be uh, very surprised if you guys aren't following these three women, Little Ray of Health on Instagram, R-A-E, Pain-Free Birth on Instagram, Karen in the Middle, Doula, Dr. Courtney Kayla, K-A-H-L-A, and obviously subscribe to The Spillover with Alex Clark anywhere you get your podcast because that's where you can hear uh, my one-on-one -on -one conversations with each of these ladies in depth on way more of these topics. Thank you guys. And by the way, if you're looking to go more non-toxic, make sure you stop at the Garnu uh, booth in the exhibit hall. That is 100% organic, conservative-owned tampons, okay? You need those. Get a free sample. Love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye.